I'm Craig Dalton. I'm the speaker for the evening. Uh, we're going to get going in just a moment here once we get a, one or two of the technical things in line. Uh, Carol, are, are you just about ready to start the recording? I started it. All right, good stuff. Uh, just a moment here. Because the Zoom is not the most important thing for me to be looking at right now. Uh, yes, hi everybody. Uh, I'm uh, and as you may have gathered, um, I'm guessing if you're here, you're in the right place. Uh, I'm Craig Dalton. I'm a professor of uh, an assistant professor of uh, geography here in the Department of Global Studies and Geography at Hofstra. Uh, uh, my pronouns are he, him, his. Uh, and before we get started, I just want to thank uh, Carol and Ethelene at the Hofstra Cultural Center, Hofstra admissions and uh, Dean Siebold for helping to arrange all this. Uh, I'll, I'm going to do a slide share here, so give me just a moment and we'll get that up and running. Okay, uh, is everybody seeing that okay? Great, thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, when, 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 when we're talking about, uh, the, well, what am I going to talk about today? Uh, I teach a couple of different kinds of classes here at Hofstra. Uh, most prominently this year, I teach a health geography course. Uh, but my primary focus uh, in global studies and geography is working with mapping and geographic data analysis. And that's really going to be the focus of what we're going to be doing here tonight. Uh, and I teach this stuff, but I also do research with it. Uh, and I do community service with it, uh, working with community partners, working with students uh, who are looking for maps and need maps. Uh, and I also have a background in the geospatial industry. Uh, now, you, you'll hear me say these words a lot tonight, you know, then mapping is often how I describe what I do, but the kind of formal technical jargony name uh, for what I do is something called geographic information systems, uh, which is a big long name with a lot of syllables in it. So we just call it GIS, because that's a lot simpler. Uh, Today, I'm going to be talking about some of the key terms in the field so you recognize them, know what people are talking about when you hear them dropped in conversation. Uh, so we're going to introduce you to the world of professional grade mapping and geographic analysis and how that can be applied in meaningful ways in a career and through classes here at Hofstra uh, in way, you know, again, in ways that are meaningful to provide and provide not just a paycheck, um, but, you know, some, some sense of accomplishment and satisfaction in doing something in the world that matters. Uh, uh, that's a really one of the, one of the things I endeavor to do uh, with, you know, with the, with the, you know, what I want my students to achieve and get out of the classes that I teach. Uh, so we're going to start by talking about some of the key terms here, and then we're going to really get into the, the center or the body of this presentation. We're going to be looking at a lot of maps and a lot of graphics. Uh, talking about uh, what the, some of the people behind them, some of my own experiences in the industry, making maps, working with data and stuff like that, working with social movements, uh, and, and so, so, some of those kinds of things. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of what our graduates in, in global studies and geography are doing, uh, and uh, some of the courses that we're going to be offering in the near future. And then at the very end, uh, I'll be uh, opening it up to any questions that you may have. Uh, so. When I, when I, let's start with the fundamentals here. Is that we're, we're looking at digital maps here, right? Uh, where do we see a GIS at work? Uh, because the GIS is the sort of thing that's often working in the background. Uh, it's a it's, it's constant process in modern life, but it's not something that people tend to notice until it breaks. Uh, so the easiest way to see where, where, where GIS, uh, mean, where the rubber meets the road, if you will, uh, is on consumer grade or consumer facing uh, map applications. Perhaps the best known one of those is Google Maps. Uh, so whether it's finding businesses or street addresses or doing turn by turn navigation on your phone, uh, this is a great big web map. Uh, and for users, it's not a GIS per se. And you'll see why when I get into that in a minute. Uh, but it, 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 in short, you can't get under the hood, you can't mess with the code, you can't mess with the data, uh, which is really what differentiates kind of that consumer grade stuff from the professional stuff we work with in, at Hofstra. Uh, uh, it just has a big massive GIS on the back end that you have to be an employee of Google uh, to, to work with. Uh, so it's designed and it's maintained by Google employees and they're doing the GIS stuff and pushing out the consumer service uh, to all of us. Uh, so and then that, that's the one example of the back end on Google, Google Maps. Uh, 
But if you have the right skills, you can also do things that build applications on top of Google Maps uh, or similar services, OpenStreetMap here. Uh, there are a couple of other ones out there. Uh, and you can more or less use those worldwide street maps as a base map. Uh, and so all, all of the services you see on here use a GIS, even the ones we don't think of as particularly uh, geographic. Uh, these are kind of, again, consumer location-based services. Uh, so one of my favorites, of course, I'm a geographer's Pokemon Go, the video game that you can play by walking around in the real world and how you walk around in the real world has consequences uh, for what you what happens in the game. Uh, you know, it's using GPS, it's tracking your location, it's using a street, it's using a street map uh, as you move around to various points of interest. Uh, the, these are all very, these are all terms of the art in GIS that we work with pretty frequently. Uh, so that, that it's, you know, it has to have that geographic element to work. Uh, and of course, there are other thing, other cases on here of applications where you really need to have uh, a geospatially aware, location-based uh, system working for the service to work. You know, Lyft, for example, they need to know where their cars are. They need to where, know where you are so they can uh, the best decide who's getting what ride or drivers can make bids. And then, you know, when, when you get to your destination, uh, where do they go next? Or food delivery with Grubhub or uh, sites for rent at Airbnb. Um, those they obviously all have geographical dimensions to the service. Uh, there are also geographical dimensions to some of these others on here, things like Facebook and Snapchat and WhatsApp, uh, which are a little, you know, the, the, you know the, the geographical part is a little less public facing. You know, Facebook is tracking our locations as best it can because it wants Ray? to better target ads at us. Uh, Ray, excuse me. Yeah. Um, is it possible for you to make your image so that you could see the whole screen of your computer? Uh, part of it is blocked. I don't know whether that's intentional. Is this showing up better? Yes. Okay, we'll run with that then. Uh, okay, so uh, when, when, when we're doing this, uh, when, we're, we're, when we're working with these kinds of uh, uh, these kinds of location-based services, you know, sometimes, you know, the consumer folks can see it, uh, sometimes they can't. Uh, so then, then that, that I'm, I'm less concerned about whether you are know, familiar with all of the uh, apps here and exactly how they work. Uh, but the, the, what I want to drive home here is that this is something that happens in a lot of applications uh, and a lot of different services out there. And these are these are just the, the the corporate ones that you've probably heard of. There are a lot of other things uh, that aren't showing up on this list that GIS can do. Uh, but the, the one thing, one plug before I move on to the next thing, uh, that this is a great example of how the working with GIS is a great crossover with other majors, uh, in this case, something like computer science. Uh, is that there are a lot of people out there with coding backgrounds, with computer science backgrounds, but relatively few of them know how to work with GIS and geospatial data. Uh, and that that is, and that having that combination of skills is kind of is a, uh, is a rarefied skill set. Uh, I worked with a student just a couple, uh, I was just just over a year ago, uh, who was working on the geographical dimensions of cybersecurity. Uh, so she was working with me in GIS, uh, and she was working with Dr. Zabu in the computer science department, and working with some stuff around spoofing and GPS and enabled applications, uh, and some of the cybersecurity dimensions of that. Uh, okay. So there we go. What is a GIS? <laughs> oh, what, what, is, what, is the, what is the thing under the hood that makes all these things tick? Uh, well, it's an actually a relatively broad thing. You know, they, we often see it associated with particular software, a particular software company. But at the crux of it, a GIS is just a system that combines two different kinds of data. It can take spatial data, like a map, and attribute data like a list or a table and combines them together to solve problems and answer questions. Uh, so you could have one in isolation. So, you know, a lot of CAD drawings uh, and uh, Adobe Illustrator uh, just have the graphics uh, or even things like Microsoft Excel or some more hardcore database programs, uh, they might just have the attribute data, the tables. Uh, the GIS is the thing that brings them together, especially at geographic kinds of scales. Uh, so it's having these two elements and using them together to solve problems and answer questions. And that might be Pokemon Go, uh, or that might be uh, you know, scientific research on climate change. Uh, 
Uh, there, there are a lot of different ways that you can you can combine these things together depending on what you want out of it. Uh, so to get it to kind of spell this out a bit more, we've got a polygon on the left in the shape of Mexico plotted on the world, and that's in, connected to a row in the table, uh, which describes all the characteristics of that polygon. So this polygon is a country. It's named Mexico. It has this many people living there. It has a square mileage of y, etc. Uh, so the, the, there's, when you start to look at how you can combine lots of different kinds of data, uh, this becomes a very, very powerful tool. So uh, I want to uh, make a little bit clear here of what some of the related technologies are and what GIS isn't. Uh, is that we would, would, it's easy when you're first introduced to this stuff to get these things mixed up of geographic information systems versus GPS. I use a lot of GPS, but it's not the same thing. Uh, GPS stands for the Global Positioning System. It's a system of satellites and receivers that provides exact location. So, it just like the chip in your phone that's the GPS chip or a dedicated you know, Garmin or Trimble unit uh, that's tracking your location with, through latitude and longitude. And it's you know, using satellite signals uh, to determine that location. So I frequently use GPS data collected with the GPS and plug it into a GIS to solve problems and answer questions. Uh, Another thing that we see a lot of uh, and they're, they're, they're becoming increasingly important in the industry uh, is uh, geographic remote sensing. And this is uh, forms of sensors, in this case, usually cameras. Uh, that you know collect data at a distance. Uh, so really, what we're looking at here for geographic applications is technically an X-ray. It could be remote sensing, uh, but for us, it's things like satellite imagery, aerial photography, and drone photography. Uh, and drone photography is kind of the new hotness for this stuff. Uh, is that then because drones are just getting getting exponentially better on a on a very very rapid basis. Uh, so uh, the kinds of imagery that you can collect, uh, you know, you don't have to buy it from NASA anymore, or hire someone with an airplane to fly it, which might make sense once a year, is you just want a photo of campus, uh, you can just go take it. Uh, it's not, you know, flying a drone, you need to be careful, you should follow regulations, you need to be safe, uh, but it is, the, bar the barrier to entry is so much lower uh, than it would be with all those other systems. Uh, so in GIS, we take a lot of data from GPS. In GIS, we take a lot of data from drones and from satellites and things like that, and we put them together to solve problems. Uh, okay, so, whoops, the real power in what we're looking at here then is combining all of these data sets together. So I can take my GPS points and I can plot them on an aerial image and then drop in a series of streets for Nassau County from the local municipal government and you know plot all the bus stops in Nassau County in one fell swoop. Uh, or another example that I like to tell about this is say I want to build an office building, an office tower. Uh, and what, how do I decide where in Nassau County I'm going to build it? Well, I, you know, the couple of things are going to come into play here is I want to build it close to a road uh, because building an office tower far from a road means I have to build a very, very long driveway and that costs money. Uh, so close to a road that can handle the traffic of the people who are going to work there. Uh, I want to make sure that it's not right, right next to a stream or on a wetland uh, because uh, new buildings on wetlands should you know, they, they shouldn't happen. It's possible to file for exceptions, but even those are very expensive. So just don't build on a wetland. Uh, you want to build, you want to buy only a single parcel of data to do that, or a single parcel of land. So I don't have to want to have to buy lots of pieces of land and stitch them together. Just give me one plot of land to buy. Uh, and then, you know, I want to make sure that I'm going to build my tower on a, you know, a stable foundation. I, I don't want it to build it on, you know, wet silt. I want to build it as best I can on bedrock. Well, a GIS can say, okay, here's a layer of streets. Here's a layer of rivers and wetlands. Here's a layer of uh, the, what the tax parcels are for owned property in Nassau County. Uh, and here's a soil map of Nassau County. Now, calculate all of these things together. And these are the places uh, that meet the criteria for all four of those, uh, meet all four of those criteria uh, that you need in this case. Uh, so they, 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 it allows you to work on, work those things together very effectively. Uh, you know, you don't want to build, you know, the, even if it's a place that's not in a wetland and close to a street, if you build that, build that building on top of a, uh, on top of silt, you're going to have the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and nobody wants that. Okay, 
So let's talk about some cases here, some actual GIS projects. Uh, this, uh, this is one of my favorites to point to recently. Uh, this is actually made by a Hofstra student. Uh, he, he, he was uh, writing a thesis on uh, urban agriculture in New York City, and specifically, he, the, I, was, I was on his committee. He was doing it through uh, the Department of uh, Geology, Environment, and Sustainability here at Hofstra. Uh, and he, when he, what he did is he was looking at uh, where, where are promising places uh, for urban urban agriculture and how can we better take advantage of what's there already. So it was taking a lot of data. So census data around poverty, uh, around, around income, and then pulling in other things of where are there existing community gardens? Where could we put them? Where are some other good candidates for places to put them? Uh, and, you know, he, he, he was working in multiple directions on this project and he's still very, very much engaged in these kinds of conversations in the city. Uh, he finished a, a few years ago. Uh, but you know, there was a lot of data, he pulled it all together, and he came up with a very effective answer to the question of, you know, what do, how, how do we uh, better assess where, uh, where we can best meet the needs for food in New York uh, with urban agriculture? Uh, so working on questions of environmental science, sustainability, a uh, great project uh, he did. Uh, other kinds of projects you'd see with environmental science are things like mapping endangered species. Uh, where are they moving? Uh, whether, where are they disappearing from? Or, you know, uh, in, in, I'm, I'm visiting a family right now for an extended period. You know, we did the isolation thing for two weeks and then relocated to Philadelphia. And everyone here is talking about the invasive uh, lanternfly population. So where is this, in this uh, invasive species? Are we likely going to see it in uh, New York City in the next couple of months or the next few years? Uh, that those mapping those kinds of species movements, expansions, and re retractions, and things like that. Uh, another good environmental application is this one. Uh, this one's getting a little bit old, but uh, it's one of my favorites because it's a good story and it's a beautiful map. Uh, this is a modeled expectation of where the tsunami is going to be from an earthquake that was off the coast of Japan a few years ago. This is the same earthquake that wiped out the nuclear power plant. Uh, and in this case, uh, you know, a tsunami could be a really big problem in the Pacific Basin. You know, you have uh, they have a you know major tectonic movement off the coast of Japan, uh, and what you'll see happening is uh, you know move a lot of water around that will create a wave or create a you know disturbance in the water, and that causes very destructive or can cause very destructive uh, tsunamis uh, even thousands of miles away. So uh, the, you know the amount of time here is limited. Of there's an earthquake it disturbs the water. Uh, and when that happens, that, that, that big mass of water or the energy of that big mass of water is going someplace. Uh, now it hit Japan in just a matter of minutes, uh, but the US Geological Survey and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration saw that there was an earthquake. They tracked this stuff constantly. Uh, and when they saw there was a major earthquake, they knew what it was. They had some sense of what the displacement was. Uh, they plugged it into a GIS model with the results of which you see here, uh, and said, okay, if the earthquake is this big and it happened at this location and in this way, how much do we, how much of the cities on the Pacific Rim do we need to evacuate? Uh, because if it was if it were just the wrong combination, you need to evacuate Honolulu, and then you need to evacuate San Francisco, and then you need to evacuate Lima in Peru and South America. Uh, and fortunately, this one was not a very big one. You know, I think by the time we got to San Francisco, the tsunami was only about 18 inches high, which is uh, not going to be not going to be too destructive. But under different circumstances, it could have been very dangerous. Uh, the compelling thing here is they were able to look at where the earthquake was anticipate how big the tsunami was going to be and what time it was going to show up in Honolulu in the time that the wave of energy was moving from the coast of Japan to Hawaii. So they got notification out to the people of the Hawaiian Islands with enough time for them to evacuate uh, if they needed to. And they, so having that kind of real-time disaster response uh, can be incredibly powerful in this case, could save lives. Uh, Another kind of example with an environmental example is, you know, the things around climate change. So uh, the working from what we know the climate records are around the world, different parts of the world, and then using the information about what the trends are for the amount of carbon in the atmosphere, or how which areas are heating up in which way for reduced, uh, for you know, increased snowmelt and glacial collapse. Uh, 
how, uh, how much higher are the sea levels going to be, adding these all into very complex GIS models uh, to anticipate what are the, the consequences for the climate going to look like uh, in the coming decades. So here we've got a few decades starting in the 1970s of established data, uh, moving into what the model expectations are going to be in the not so distant future. Uh, so. This, 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 is, uh, you know, this is a big deal in GIS, being able to do uh, work on this scale with this kind of importance. Uh, it's also something that we see being done here at Hofstra, as uh, one, one of my friends, uh, also in the GES department, uh, Geology, Environment, and Sustainability, uh, as Jace Bernhardt does, actually does some virtual reality work around how people respond to disaster uh, situations, uh, so around hurricanes here in Long Island. Uh, so he's a climatologist by, climatologist by training, uh, but gets into the, you know, how, how do people decide when they evacuate, when to evacuate and when not to, and can that be, can their choices be affected uh, with the right kind of visualizations or virtual reality experience? Uh, so uh, that's, that's one of, another example of the sort of thing we're looking at here with GIS. Uh, what else? What other things are GIS used for? Uh, well, my very first gigs in GIS, because I'd never heard of what GIS was until until I saw it in college and said, "Hey, I like maps. Uh, I'll take a few classes in this." I took a few classes in it. I liked it, uh, and it landed me several internships in local government and local public services. Uh, the, you know, the ones I started off with were transportation planning, and then some water uh, water services. Uh, one of some of the big ones we have here in uh, southern New York are things like uh, the, the fire department. Of New York. Uh, the, the FDNY has one of the largest, uh, most prolific GIS uh, departments uh, in the region. And they're doing things like mapping, you know, how many fires do we have in this neighborhood versus that neighborhood to better allocate resources and looking at what their response times are. You know, how can we improve the fire department's response times when they get a call? Uh, and you know, this is just kind of scratching the surface of what they do. They, they do some very hardcore traffic analysis, which is difficult to do. Uh, but you know, obviously they, having this kind of local municipal government, this is a, you know, a tool, you know, it, it's not as stylish as Pokemon Go or uh, Google Maps. I know Pokemon Go is kind of passe at this point, but I'm a geographer, I'm allowed to like it. Uh, that, that hadn't, but you know, this is working behind the scenes to have better fire or EMS uh, response times. Uh, that's very important uh, for, you know, <laughs> as a resident of New York City, I very much like to see that. Uh, Okay, some other kinds of things we see it used for uh, is it's very frequently used in transportation, transportation and transit. So, well, well, if, they, if we're the way, if there's a backup or derailment on the subway, where the delay is going to be, where is there going to be work on the streets today, or things like longer term, larger scale traffic planning, like you, yeah, they, they just removed the toll booth uh, from the Triborough Bridge in between Manhattan, Queens, and the Bronx. Well, by moving removing the toll tolls there, people move through the bridge faster. Does that mean we're more likely to see other traffic jams all emerging elsewhere in the city because the delay isn't on the bridge? It's someplace else. Well, by having a traffic model, uh, you can anticipate some, what some of those problems are and allocate resources for infrastructure appropriately, uh, or, or you know, not not have two construction sites in exactly the wrong place that will cause massive traffic jams. Uh, so that, that this GIS is very commonly used in these kinds of civil engineering, urban planning uh, kinds of applications, you know, be it water or traffic or in the, you know, the, the, the Department of Buildings uh, and stuff like that. Uh, in fact, I have a friend who lives just across the street from me who only his entire job is working on GIS of the Metro North line that goes to New Haven. That is a full-time job, not just for him, for his, but for his department. Uh, is making sure that people, uh, they, they are, the trains run on time and the infrastructure is maintained. Uh, okay, so what else have we got? Uh, oops. Uh, Another thing we have here at Hofstra is uh, some specialty in transportation and logistics. Uh, you know, it's uh, things like, I'll start with the story of UPS trucks. Uh, have you ever seen a UPS truck turn left? Probably, probably not. Uh, UPS has a very, very large complex GIS. And one of the things that they do in allocating their trucks is try to minimize left turns. Because if you have a running of fleet of, 300,000, I don't know how many trucks UPS has, 300,000 trucks and 10,000 trucks. 
and they're driving 100 miles a day, if they're pause, each one of them is pausing for let's say three or four minutes a day uh, because they're taking unnecessary left turns, that's burning gallons and gallons of diesel fuel. Uh, and extrapolate that over a year, you could be saving a whole lot of money just by driving fewer miles or spending less time idling at traffic lights. Uh, so we need you know, real economies of scale kinds of things of, of having fewer trucks with that many trucks start uh, not in taking left turns, you're going to be saving a fair amount of money in how you route your trucks. Uh, so that this is something you can calculate with the GIS. You know, it's relatively simple. You know, say I've got Google Maps, great. I know how to get from here to my friend's house at this street address. But if you're doing that with a few thousand trucks all simultaneously with a whole bunch of packages that need to be routed and allocated for that, that is a very specific customized GIS system. Uh, that's also something uh, that, that you know that we see frequently in things like not just you know shipping and cargo uh, in trucks and UPS, but shipping and cargo is across the ocean uh, through airplanes, um, things like that. Uh, and that sort of managing international shipping is actually something that we do very well here at Astra. Uh, is that we here in Clinton's the Department of Global Studies and Geography, uh, we have one of the world experts in transportation geographers geography. Uh, Dr. Jean-Paul Rodrigue, he literally wrote the book on these kinds of transportation geography concerns. Uh, we also have a couple of graduates who work in the industry. I really try not to name names of my graduates for student protection, uh, you know, student privacy, uh, but in the, in where they work and these kinds of logistics firms are uh, with some very fancy good guests uh, to get out of college. Uh, so what are some other things we see done with GIS? Uh, one of the big ones, and this one, you, this is the other place you may have seen some GIS work outside of something like the consumer application is in journalistic, or journalism and journalistic output. So things like the National Geographic Society. Uh, when I finished, when I finished college, I did a few internships uh, with local with local GIS agencies. My first job, I started the day after I graduated from college, was at the National Geographic Society in Washington D.C., which was a great job, especially for someone. Uh, moving to the city in, their, in his early 20s, uh, you know, work in National Geographic during the day and go out on the weekends and have fun. Uh, and so, the, the, you know, things like National Geographic, which has its own, you know, it's National Geographic, they have their own maps department. Uh, so they, they are making maps like this. This is a map of bird migration routes in the Americas. Uh, and it's uh, one of my favorites. The, the colors are amazing. Uh, and we can also see thing, you know, th things like this happening in uh, not just in National Geographic, uh, but also in other uh, places that you more conventionally might see it, things like the New York Times or BuzzFeed uh, or the Washington Post, The Guardian, uh, you know, ABC News, Fox News, uh, that most and you know, many, many uh, uh, news outlets these days have a graphics department and at least one person whose job it is to make the geographic information graphics to make the maps of what they're working with. Uh, so here we have a good, a good example um, uh, from this past summer, a story that ran in the New York Times. Uh, what they were doing in the New York Times here uh, was, you know, map mapping uh, Black Lives Matter and the incidences of BLM uh, events, protests, all sorts of things all, all around the country to show that you know, this, you know, this is not something that was just happening in Washington, D.C. or just happening in Minneapolis and Louisville, that this uh, was a very, very uh, widespread geographic phenomenon. Uh, so, and they, they, that's one of, the, one of the ways in which we see data journalism becoming increasingly prominent. Some of the other places we see it are, you know, more specifically data-oriented news organizations, things like Vox Media, or, uh, well, they now have a bad, <laughs> badish reputation uh, because they called the election not exactly the way it went, uh, but 538. Uh, I'm still a fan of 538, even if they don't get it 100% right all the time. Uh, so that they're doing a lot of data, geographically driven uh, data analyses for, for telling stories in the news media uh, that you know, have data backing behind them, which is a very big deal these days. Uh, 
Now, when I finished working at National Geographic, uh, I moved to New York City. Um, my partner, she does theater, so uh, New York was the place to be. Uh, and I went out and found what job I could. And the job that I found, again, it relied on GIS. Uh, it was working in real estate. Uh, and specifically, I worked at a real estate agency uh, in Manhattan, and they, they needed somebody who could read property surveys. So literally going around the outside of a property describing what land is owned under this deed. Uh, uh, apparently either as a waste of the lawyer's time or the lawyers were just not used to thinking in spatial terms because they just hired an undergraduate geography major with a background in GIS to read surveys. Um, I'm not complaining, it was a good job. Uh, but you know, this is, you know, GIS is a very important tool if you're working in real estate, uh, whether you're reading surveys or getting into sales or, you know, doing assessing, uh, you know, looking at the age of the property, looking at the characteristics of the property. Uh, a lot of the stuff you know, in kind of the public facing side of it you see these days uh, is something like Zillow, uh, with, you know, the geographic property listing service. So you can go on there, even if your house isn't for sale, they'll give you an estimate on what it's worth. Uh, no, I'm not saying the estimate's going to be very good, uh, but uh, you will get an estimate. Uh, so that that you know have have these sorts the sorts of options for you know I certainly went with, when we were looking at co-op apartments in uh, in Queens as it was a very handy resource. And this again is the public facing stuff. There's a lot of stuff that's done in real estate uh, that you know it's only for the brokers or only for the professionals in the field uh, because that, that, that not all some of that data you pay for it's proprietary and stuff like that. Uh, so they, they kind of give you a little bit of a sense of what's going on with this stuff. Uh, so the real estate, uh, to be honest, in the long run, working in Manhattan and in, in real estate was not for me. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was not the lifestyle I was looking for. I went back to graduate school, might be for you. I uh, just didn't agree with me. Uh, that I was in there for a while and I, I just couldn't, I couldn't keep it up. Uh, so I went to graduate school instead. Uh, uh, so uh, at least that at least that one was uh, limited in the time frame. Uh, graduate school is great, but also do as little of it as possible. Uh, <laughs> now, what did I do after that? Well, I went to graduate school and I kind of stuck with the housing thing a little bit, uh, but I was interested in how are map technologies uh, being used by social movements and being used by the technology industry? Um, the question of my dissertation was how is Google Maps changing how we see and understand the world? Uh, and when, when, when we start looking at these maps, then this is especially where the things that matter, uh, that, that matter in things you can do in your career that will have some real social value start, start to really uh, carry some weight. So things, you know, social movements, you know, it's, it's not as good and good paying as working for UPS, but if you have the skills, uh, there are social movements who can put this stuff to good use. Uh, one of the big ones, uh, is, or one of the most influential in New York lately has been Inside Airbnb, uh, which is an organization that scrapes all of the data off of Airbnb and makes a model and tracks it, builds a database of it, and is trying to assess what is the economic impact on the New York City housing market that Airbnb is having. Uh, is it actually driving gentrification, as a lot of people blame Airbnb for, uh, or is it actually a way for scared people to make a living on the side when they're out of town? Uh, I mean, these are kind of tricky, kind of tricky questions. Uh, but you know, when you can get them the entire data set as they do off of, off of Airbnb, because Airbnb lists it, uh, you can begin to engage this and answer the question in a data-driven fashion. Uh, now, Airbnb was kind of became famous a few years ago because uh, uh, the, the inside Airbnb was keeping track of all this stuff and Airbnb was afraid that there were going to be some new regulations coming down so they're forcing them to be regulated like a hotel, uh, like a hotel chain, which they effectively are. Uh, and so Airbnb released a whole lot of data from their own servers uh, and, and saying, that, oh no, this is the way that people are making money on the side. Uh, and inside Airbnb, the organization was able to say, hold on, you deleted more than a thousand listings from the database that you just made public that made you look bad. You cannot claim that this is the real data because we also have the real data. They caught Airbnb out making false statements with their data. The New York State Legislature was not amused. Uh, so they changed the regulations and made them uh, significantly tighter than they had been before uh, under New York State law. Uh, 
Now, there's still the questions about the you know, extent and kinds of gentrification. And it's clear that in some neighborhoods, especially especially um, parts of Manhattan that are, are really stylish, there is some good evidence that uh, people are being priced out of the market because landlords are converting residential living spaces into temporary short-term Airbnbs. Uh, but when you get out to the less desirable neighborhoods uh, out in Queens, I could say that I live in Queens, uh, then, then, the, the, then the tie between these two is much much less clear. Uh, so it's, it, it's a little bit tricky. There's a very good case in some circumstances, very not as strong case in other cases, but that's geography. You're going to have variations across space. Uh, so that's a, a, a great use of this by social movement. Another related social movement, one of the ones that I get very excited about these days, is an organization out of the San Francisco Bay Area. They're now working in many places across the United States uh, called the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project, uh, which is making maps of evictions. And boy, they're working hard right now, uh, making maps of ev evictions in the United States. Uh, they started in San Francisco, again, because of the housing crisis in San Francisco. You know, talk about a place that has even more expensive housing than New York, San Francisco. Uh, and, and looking at how, how many people are being evicted or, and really the amazing stuff they've been doing is where do our people moving to, which is really hard data to get. You know, they're pulling in information from court filings, from the planning department, and going down on the ground and running surveys, talking to people, and looking at the geographic distribution of if people are displaced or are being forced to move out of an eviction situation, where are they going? Uh, you know, are they just moving down the street? Are they moving out of San Francisco? Are they moving out of the United States? Uh, is it engaging those kinds of questions? Uh, Another kinds of things that we see, and this is actually a project that was made by uh, one of the students in one of my GIS classes. This is a map looking at uh, race and, and the amount, number of dollars spent per pupil a, in Long Island schools. Uh, so this is just NASA on Suffolk County, uh, but you know, asking the classic question for education, separate but, e, separate but equal question mark. Uh, and we can see, they see that they, you know, where we have large percentages of uh, you know, BIPOC populations, uh, and we can see how much money is spent per student uh, in each of those areas, at least in public schools. Uh, in this case, uh, there's not a clear relationship, but there are the relationship, you know, like on a scatter plot, uh, correlation between the two, but there are some correspondences in individual places where, you know, they're, they're clearly the places with the lar larger uh, populations of people in racial minorities are not getting as good funding uh, in their public schools. Uh, this won an award at a uh, at, at a um, academic conference we went to in I believe yeah it was 2018. Uh, so then uh, this student that went on is, is now in medical school and is doing fabulous work. I believe the last I heard she was working on uh, questions of excess deaths uh, during now during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, speaking of the pandemic, this is a very, <laughs> a lot of the public health work that's being done around the pandemic uses GISs. So look, talking about things like flattening the curve, where, or you know, the, the Gothamist has a regular series of what are the COVID-19 statistics for New York City today, and they update it every day, and it includes several maps that breaks out, you know, positivity rates, uh, number of people who have the disease out of a population of 100,000, so you can compare one area versus another. Uh, and that's, you know, that's being run at the Gothamist, another good example of uh, data journalism. Uh, but we also see things like this, which is, this is the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center, uh, which as far as I've been able to tell, and I've spent a lot of time working on infectious disease in the last year, uh, is, as far as I can tell, this is the most comprehensive rep um, uh, representative data source out there. It's directly comparable to information from source resources like the WHO that has key, keeping track of what is the situation of the pandemic on a global basis. And you know, the, I'm showing you the world map here, but this breaks down all the way down to county level. Uh, so the, the, not for every country, but certainly in the United States and parts of Europe and parts of Brazil, uh, 
in places where the, where the pandemic is hitting especially hard. Uh, and in keeping a tally, a rough cut of what, what are the trends. And they also do some very good work. They have a cardigram, you know, the breaking out the United States by state of, you know, they have what's happening with rates and flattening the curve or not flattening the curve uh, by states. You can see where the spikes were in North Dakota. You can see the recent spike in Rhode Island uh, so that we can begin to compare some of these places against one another. Uh, now, so obviously, you know, making a map, knowing how disease spreads, this is actually how GIS first got started. One of the, you know, one of the very earliest spatial analyses was run in the 1850s, mapping cholera in London. Uh, so there's a long tradition of working with, uh, working on topics of infectious disease uh, through GIS and before that, you know, paper mapping and spatial data. Uh, another example of what we do with health and GIS is not just you know, infectious disease, but questions of fitness and infrastructure of, you know, if we build more sidewalks, will that encourage more people to walk and impact the obesity rate? Uh, or this is a project that I did uh, with, uh, with um, some folks in health professions and in the math department. Uh, we were making a map. This was just a sample study of one road. That's why there's only one road across the middle. Uh, doing a site survey of bikeability. There's also a, we did a walking survey at the same time uh, that's looking at, you know, the, the Sunrise Highway in southern Nassau County and the, mapping it for how bikeable or versus how dangerous uh, that section of road is. So things like crosswalks, is there a divide, divide, is, is there a side if there is a sidewalk, is it right next to the road, or do you have a grass median between the two? Uh, look at looking at those kinds of considerations. To say, uh, how can we make this more biking friendly or walking friendly infrastructure? Uh, because and this is actually one of the ways I paid for rent in the summers in graduate school was working on public health studies associated with infrastructure and walkable walkable planning for towns uh, because there is good evidence that if you have if you live in a nice place to walk you're more likely to do it and walking more is good physical exercise uh, okay some other kinds of stuff we work with, getting back into the social movement stuff. Uh, one, this is one of my favorite projects. This is a map. Uh, I went to school, I went to graduate school in North Carolina. I uh, lived in Chapel Hill and the, the you know, lefty town on the side of it, Carborough. Uh, and Carborough you know, was for years, you know, these days it is a, uh, it, it is a very shishi expensive place to live. It's right near the university. Uh, some of the most expensive real estate in North Carolina. Uh, but it hasn't always been that way. It was an old mill town. So there is a very long, rich history in Carborough, and specifically a very long, rich black history in Carborough uh, that you wouldn't know that's there because it's, now it's all wine bars and co-op grocery stores and stuff like that. Uh, so this was a project run with local teenagers talking to people who still lived in the community about what their memories were of growing up and living in Carborough and living in Chapel Hill, which is just, it's on the other side of this piece of paper, as Black Americans in 1940s, 1950s, 1960s. So look, mapping things like what their, you know, their segregated high school before the schools were integrated, or uh, the, the several places where they had sit-ins in Chapel Hill. Uh, the important, you know, important real history that happened that, you know, if you're walking down the street today, you wouldn't know that that's where you're standing. It's one place where they did a city in, in the 1960s. Uh, so uh, the social movements, you know, keeping the memory, of, well, keeping the memory alive, but uh, show, uh, showing how these things are living history and change is possible. Uh, Another example, uh, in, speaking of perhaps change is possible in a more negative fashion, uh, we've got things like this. This is uh, a social movements map that's very live and very dynamic. It's a map called HK Map Live. That's Hong Kong uh, Map Live. It's an application uh, that was being used, especially in the, over the last year and a half or so in Hong Kong as a map used by pro-democracy demonstrators in Hong Kong to try to elude a police arrest. Uh, as a lot of the demonstrations in Hong Kong uh, got very dangerous and, and pretty violent, uh, partly from the protesters, partly from the police. Uh, but this was the protesters' way of coordinating to outflank the police so the police can surround them and arrest them all, or how to best respond to it. So the Chinese government actually forced uh, Apple to take this off the App Store. But you know there are many other ways to install apps. Uh, and uh, I'm, 
Honestly, I haven't gone back to check on it lately, uh, but it is a very much on the ground street protest application. Uh, and then, you know, again, you hadn't, you hadn't, you much, much like in a more military sense of knowing how the other side is moving and how they're uh, they anticipating what their movements are going to be uh, gives you a leg up on the ground in that kind of confrontation. Uh, another kind of example, uh, this is getting into some projects I've done with uh, uh, Dr. Bradley Filippi in uh, the department, uh, you know, very much older than the last case, uh, are an archaeologist here at Hofstra in anthropology. Uh, and he does, uh, this connects with the social movement, he does a community oriented archaeology thing, doing work on, I believe, on BIPOC communities here in Long Island through time. Uh, so I did some work with him a few years ago, a few summers ago, um, where we, which he had a bunch of historical maps. And we, in GIS, we were able to take those historical maps, digitize them so they're in a digital format, and then twist them around so they all layered on top of each other correctly in geographic space. So you can see the current map there on the left and some of the historical maps there on the right uh, to help him best figure out the play promising places to check out and learn about what's going to be promising uh, for under those circumstances where he wants uh, to pursue his dig sites and his projects. Uh, another kind of example we've seen uh, with this lately was uh, finding a whole new Mayan city that no one that, that, that no one well no one outside the Yucatan had known about using remote sensing in GIS. I was thinking it was covered in jungle, it's hard to see. I'm sure that some of the locals knew it was there, but uh, that, that being able to image that through the trees, figure out where it was, can you get a sense of what the layout of what the city was uh, using GIS. The, the GIS is a very common tool in archeology span these days. Uh, and I actually had one of my students, the shared student who was both an archaeology major and or an anthropology major studying archaeology and a GIS major. Uh, she was looking at, well, if, if we're seeing a rising sea level change and the Yucatan is relatively low lying, uh, how much of a difference are we going to see uh, with archaeological sites being flooded due to climate change? And she was able to make that model, did a very good advanced GIS project on that uh, just last fall. Uh, so. Last, the, the, one of the last big thematic things I want to talk about is moving from the anthropology department to the political science department, is that GIS is very commonly used in working with political data and political analysis these days. So somebody had to go out and make all of those red state, blue state maps that just came out of the electoral college in the presidential election. So here we've got our conventional uh, electoral college map. Uh, I think that, yeah, this is the one from Politico. Uh, but you know, as a, as a geographer and someone interested in demographics and society and power, uh, this doesn't actually tell us a whole lot. The Electoral College is actually not a great representative model of how the American public is thinking or voting. Uh, so what if instead of looking at the Electoral College, which does ultimately legally carry the weight, but if we instead, if we want to just understand what's going on, look at it by county. And then look at not just whether it went red or whether it went blue, but how strongly red and how strongly blue. And we see here, you know, despite, despite how things are going in Washington right now, the United States is remarkably mixed. Uh, so we see a whole lot of purple on that map. Yes, there are some very red rural areas. And yes, there are some very blue urban areas. Um, but in general, it's kind of mixed up. And the idea of geography is not a matter of, you know, oh, I live in New York, I must be a blue stater. Uh, or, and as we really see, a lot of the patterns these days has less to do with which state you reside in, but whether you live in a city. Uh, so we, again, this is, this is something I see thrown around on Twitter all the time, which is really a, a really disconcerting idea. So if you look at the red state map, you think that red wins every time. Well, the thing is, red doesn't, you know, land doesn't vote, people do. And there are a whole lot more people in cities than the maps will necessarily show. You know, the United States, most Americans live in or near a major metropolitan area. So when we look at the, here we have red and blue for which way each one of these counties voted, but the size of the circle shows how many people live there. So you can see the Pacific, uh, you know, the East Northeast, you can see San Francisco Bay Area, the Los Angeles, the Pacific Northwest, uh, that's Atlanta, Chicago, Minneapolis, St. Paul, uh, is that uh, those can actually carry a great deal of weight uh, because a whole lot of Americans live in cities, but you don't necessarily see that on the red state, blue state map. To know this, you got to dig deeper into the data. Uh, 
So, you know, looking at election returns is one thing we do with GIS and political uh, work, but we also look at things like pulling an election forecast. I mentioned it before, these are 538's forecasts maps and they involve a whole lot of probability. Uh, you know, and they, I think they finally concluded, we see here that, uh, um, uh, and then, then Joe Biden had an 89 out of 100 uh, chance of winning. You know, out of 100 given elections, he would win 89 of them. And Donald Trump would win uh, 10, and one would be a tie. Uh, so, you know, look at look at the probabilities there. Uh, and that's the kind of thing you can do when you run a lot of polls, you synthesize a lot of polls, you can jump all that data into a GIS and start uh, extrapolating on what the results are likely to be. Uh, well, of course, we all know what the results are now, but this is, you know, this is from before the election. Uh, another case we see uh, are things that are going to be happening in the next few years here in the United States is congressional redistricting uh, and state legislature redistricting. Uh, kind of a popular term for this is gerrymandering. You know, it's when a political party draws the lines as opposed to benefit themselves uh, rather than uh, the, trying to have a representative democracy. Uh, so, you know, if you want to find a dirty, seamy underside to American democracy, one of the easiest ways to do it is look at how are the congressional district lines drawn? And you take a look at the ones in New York City and New York, Southern New York State, you'll see New York is no exception. Uh, some of my favorites, oh, here, here's one that's outside of Houston. Uh, it's supposed to be a single community of interest uh, and it's just kind of all the way halfway around Houston. Uh, one of my favorite ones that doesn't exist anymore is outside Philadelphia. I was described as it looked like Donald Duck being kicked by Goofy, the shape of the district. Uh, so let's have the GIS is one of those things where it's a technology. So people use GIS to make gerrymanders, but also if you're going to solve gerrymandering, you're going to have to use some GIS to do it as well. Uh, so the, the, that's some of the other things we see with this. The, the last few things I want to get into here, some more of the student projects, that some, uh, some of my student projects I'm especially proud of uh, and work with some of the community partners that I've done here at Hofstra. Uh, so we see things like this. This is a project with two of my, three of my students uh, and working with Martine Hackett in the Department of Health Professions. Uh, she was made, she needed some maps because she was going to go before the Nassau County, or Nassau County Legislature, uh, made, making the case for more funding funding uh, for uh, prenatal care and immediate postnatal care. Uh, so we were ma making maps of things like infant mortality. In this case, we got two maps uh, involving respiratory health. Uh, so looking at you know uh, respiratory hazards and particulate matter, which is especially dangerous for very, very young babies. Uh, and looking at what the, what the distribution of these things are in the air in different parts of Nassau County. Uh, and as you can see, they track very closely by income and very closely uh, by uh, minority populations. Uh, you see things like Hempstead here, and then parts of, parts of Valley Stream and Glencoe uh, has some of the worst air pollution in the county. Uh, and, the, and dealing with this, the, the word for this is environmental justice. Uh, and GIS is a very useful tool in those kinds of pursuits. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. A few, some of the other projects for my students. Uh, this is a project uh, of Hofstra's campus. Uh, they, we, uh, this was a survey, a class of mine. We went out, we surveyed the entire campus, went back and made a map of it. This is a map of gender inclusive restrooms. Uh, so the idea of this map is so that any anybody of any gender identity can find a safe place to use the bathroom uh, here at Hofstra. Uh, and so when the buildings in blue uh, were places that did have them, buildings in white were ones that didn't. So this was fully five years ago now. I'm sure that I know some of the buildings on this need to be updated. Uh, but, you know, prompt the administration a little bit to say, we should, we should have some more of these. Uh, it's really just a matter of changing signs. Uh, some other people I've worked with here in the area uh, so is uh, people like the Uniondale Community Land Trust. Uh, they're working on issues of, for, of affordable housing uh, here in Uniondale uh, and working uh, here, uh, here being uh, where Hofstra is. Uh, and what they're working on, you know, ma making sure that, that the people have affordable, good, solid places to live, uh, which is a very a serious issue here in Long Island. Uh, another one uh, is this is a math that was made by two students working with a local organization uh, 
uh, called uh, Docs for Tots or part of a Help Me Grow initiative. This is a pediatric nonprofit uh, and they wanted a map of where they were serving families, where they were getting the most responses for their uh, pediatric uh, care, where, the, when, where there was the greatest need. So we put together this map of them. So they were able to use this map to both figure out where, the, where they were getting a lot of people from, but also using it uh, in, um, you know, pursuing grants and money and publicity and stuff like that. Uh, so uh, that's uh, some of the kinds of projects that we've been, uh, that I and my colleagues uh, here at Hofstra have been working on. Uh, but we also see what some of our recent graduates are doing. We, 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 uh, one, of, one of the ones we like to talk about the most here in Global Studies and Geography works at Apple, but people in the tech industry, working at a nonprofit land trust, not just the one in uh, Uniondale, but there are others elsewhere, uh, most recently one in Northern Massachusetts. Uh, we have students working at the United, former students working in the United Nations, uh, working in transportation and logistics, project management, other things, those kinds of industries. Uh, I'm also, it's a recommendation letter letter season right now because I have a bunch of students who are applying to graduate school, but uh, we currently have uh, the, the former graduates who have gone on to graduate study in urban planning, medicine, environmental economics, public health, and law in places like Columbia University and University College London. So some very prominent uh, programs, uh, if you know, going for those masters and PhDs and MDs kinds of stuff. Uh, so that's what some of our students have been doing lately uh, once they graduate. Uh, so turning to the near future here uh, in the Department of Global Studies and Geography, we have a number of GIS classes coming up, things that I'm teaching. Uh, we have a class called Geography 007, Fun with Maps and GIS, and we try to make it exactly that, just a very light introduction. Uh, it's a one credit class, of, you know, it's a project class. We go out, collect some data, bring it back to the lab and make a map out of it. Uh, well, the, the virtual lab in this case, but my understanding is we're still going out collecting data even under pandemic circumstances because outside is actually one of the places you can go. Uh, the more systematic introduction is Geography 60, which is Introduction to Digital Maps or Intro GIS. We're the, currently in the process of converting the course titles. Uh, there's also a cartographic design class and some more advanced uh, GIS classes and a field methods class. Uh, there's also a class that has some GIS in it that I teach every fall uh, called Global Health Geography. We just wrapped up the wrapped it up uh, this past year, and we'll be offering it again next fall. Uh, that you know ties directly into you know concerns of how you know not just health professions and the new nursing program, or for students who are interested in doing pre med study. Uh, but then, you know, a lot, a lot of stuff, you know, knowing your way, not just about the disease, uh, disease conditions and mortality, morbidity here in Long Island, but in different places around the world and what those patterns are. Uh, I'm also, for the first time next fall, I'm excited about this. I'm teaching an honors college seminar uh, called Maps and Monsters, uh, it's cartography from dragons to Google. So uh, I finally get to do the thing I've been trying for my entire career and just teach a class about monsters, uh, which to be serious, you know, you can learn a lot about a society by looking at what they put on their maps and looking at what people fear. Uh, that fear is tremendously powerful looking at society and culture. Uh, so we're gonna be looking at uh, societies through the monsters on their maps. Uh, so uh, the, the, uh, some of those count towards general knowledge. We also have a bunch of other classes that are gonna be coming up in the Global Studies and Geography this spring and this fall, uh, things like peak global environments and cultures, formerly world regional geography, transportation, urbanization, a couple of uh, regional classes around things like India and its neighbors and Latin America, an economic geography class, and then getting into the global studies side of the department, which is looking at increasing, increasingly globalized processes, you know, globalization in action whether culturally or in terms of transportation logistics or in terms of human rights, uh, some great classes on human trafficking, you know, terrible topic, but great, great class. Uh, and that of course feeds into the majors that we have in the department. So we've got both BA and BS majors in the department, a Bachelor of the Arts major in geography or geography and concentrating in GIS. We also have a BS major in GIS. We kind of designed it this way because if you're studying GIS, it often makes sense to study it with something as you may have noticed in this talk. So you're studying journalism and majoring in GIS or you're studying ecology 
and GIS, or pre-med and GIS, and you're getting into the public health epidemiology side, and civil engineering, uh, there's, there's, and combining these things. So this way, someone with a BA major can co-major with something with GIS, or someone with a BS major can uh, double major with GIS. Uh, we also have them in global studies, and then we have a variety of uh, minors in geography, global studies, GIS, and a shared minor between us and computer science. Uh, and really getting into the department, we do try very hard to make sure it's a community. There's a lot of other things that ha happen in the department for uh, students to pick this up with. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I can't say this about all the departments on campus. I don't know of them as nearly as well as ours, but we try very hard to sponsor a community of students that are peer supporting and help each other out. Uh, we have a lounge, when, when it's not a pandemic, we have a lounge where they spend most of the week hanging out, it seems. Uh, and that's really important a peer support experience to have in college is you can talk to your professors, we're right there. Uh, but you can talk to your peers, learn about what classes you want to take, solve the problems. You know, if I'm having problems in intro GIS or what the students are having problems in Latin American geography, the chances are someone else in the hanging out there in the department between classes can help them out with it. Uh, so the department community is actually very important to us. Uh, you know, they, they build a lounge and they will come kind of idea. We also have, you know, have the events at every semester. We have an honors organization. Uh, we frequently study, uh, sponsor study abroad, internships, honors theses. And again, as I mentioned before, a whole lot of double majors. Uh, Okay, and then this is the way I always finish my talks, especially for local audiences, uh, is are you in the Long Island, New York City metro area, and do you need a map made? Let me know. I'm always looking for new projects, new ideas, and my students are always looking for good stuff for them to work on uh, over the course of the semester. So give me, give, me a, give me a call or drop me an email. I'll drop my contact in the chat here in a, just in a minute. Uh, and then very finally, thank you very much for stick, uh, sticking around through all of this. Uh, and do you have any questions? Uh, give me just a sec. Uh, if, if you can, if we're going to do the questions, uh, can we put those in the uh, chat box? Uh, and I'm going to hold on here. There we go. And I'll drop my contact in there so you can all see it. Okay, does anyone have any questions? My name is Nero from the geology department. Mm -hmm. Officer, I like to talk. Congratulate you very much indeed. Uh, the combination between other subjects and uh, the GIS, that's the most important aspect. I would like to emphasize one thing though. The information that you put on a map has to be gathered in some other fashion and then you can put it on the map. The map part of it, the computer aspects of making the map is a GIS part, but the information gathering is, is another altogether different item. I would like you to make a comment about that. The information gathering and the map making. The GIS is at the map making end of the project and putting the information in the proper location. I mean, the fully, I think if my students that oh, I know are here are gonna commiserate over this is that fully half of any given GIS project is just getting the data. Now, whether that's a field survey going out with GPS units or shooting photos with drones or collecting information from surveys around public health or going to the US census and getting it all in line, fully half the struggle is getting the data and getting it in. And that is, you know, that is, Sometimes it's very much geographically oriented. You need your concepts of you know, knowing how to maximize the quality of your GPS receiver signal to maximize the accuracy of your latitude and longitude readings. And sometimes it's a completely separate field, you know, pulling in you know, into economic data of joblessness claims over the last three years, looking right. for how that happens. Uh, so you know, it, it's absolutely a challenge. Uh, and frequently in my experience with it in uh, professional settings, there are some people who just do GIS and just manage the data. But a lot of people are doing GIS 30 hours a week and doing something else the other 10 to 
15 to 10 to 30, you know, uh, that, yeah. you know, from professional geologists who's doing field surveys and then coming back and working with GIS, which is part of the reason why it's so important to be able to work these majors together. Oh, or someone working in public health who's working on disease modeling or whether, you know, look, looking at what the quality of their uh, the survey responses are, but also need uh, to plug in the spatial side of it. Uh, I'm going to take Greg, it uh, there. Uh, go ahead, Brett. Uh, thank you. I was going to just say the neighbor's question um, kind of leads into Cameron's question in the chat here about how easy or difficult would it be to double major with GIS? Thanks. Yeah. The, 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 uh, and then, then Cameron, the, the big question there is, well, it depends on what other major you're talking about, uh, is that we're, we're frequently, you know, they, with some kinds of majors, they, they synergize very, very well. Uh, so they, you know, ecology, biology, uh, sustainability, geology, as I'm sure Brett's familiar with, uh, but also things like history and sustain uh, history or political science. I've had a lot of majors do both of those. People who are doing doing with health professions. Uh, I'll be honest, there are some majors where it's there's just fewer required classes that overlap. Uh, so studio art, for example, I would love to have more studio artists in my cartographic design class, uh, but in general, there are fewer studio art majors to do both. I still get some, they're fabulous people to have in the uh, cartographic design class, but it really, that's the kind of individual question of which other majors you're looking at uh, that I'll be able to answer the question for. Something like geology or like history or like uh, health professions, uh, they, they will over, overlap very easily. Uh, if you have a specific major in mind, I'm just scanning the uh, environmental resource manager, or environmental resource, yes, that's a natural synergy with GIS. I'd be happy to chat with you about it. Uh, okay, moving on to the next question here. Uh, Yes, I see from I see from my colleague Dr. Rodriguez. Yeah, gathering the data is usually eighty percent of the work. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, I don't know if you want to have pile onto that more, John Paul, but yeah, <laughs> getting the data is it's it's a lot of the work. Uh, uh, okay, how much would a person need to know to code to pursue a career in GIS? Well, again. That's going to depend on what your applications are. People who are working in GIS full time, the 40 hour a week, always doing database stuff, they're going to need to know some code. Uh, they're going to need to be comfortable with some code. Uh, that, but like I said, the folks who are going out and doing field surveys, you know, half their time, or you know, the former student of mine who was working in the land trust who was doing grant writing and managing interns and doing GIS, uh, is that for her needs, most of that stuff is going to be off the shelf. Uh, that she, did, that she didn't need to do a whole lot of coding because most of the things that she needed the software to do were already built in as tools. Uh, a lot of education, for example, uh, you know, they're, they're building basic maps, things like that, uh, you're not going to need to do a lot of coding. If you're going to do, if you're going to build models, then you're going to need to know how to code. So again, it depends to a certain extent what you're doing with it. Uh, and the more complex it is, the more full-time the position, uh, the more coding is going to be required. Uh, now in code, coding here in GIS uh, in, at Hofstra, uh, I, you know, I understand it can be intimidating, so we start easy and we work our way up. Uh, so we, in fact, I actually don't even use the word coding in the intro class, even though that's what students are actually doing. And then by the time we get to the advanced class where we do call it coding, uh, the students are like, well, I, they're intimidated by it. And then I say, well, you've been building code for the last two semesters in GIS class. It really worked out OK before, right? So let's just keep building on top of that. Uh, uh, did that fully answer your question there, Chris? All right, uh, I'll come back to you if you need to. Uh, okay, uh, how would you really recommend starting a search for entry-level positions, GS positions for recent grads? That is a tricky question because it is a cold job market out there right now. Uh, if you're looking for the kind of position that, that again, the full timer kind of position, there are some specific resources for that. So websites like GIS Lounge, or the Association of American Geographers, uh, the, the 
Jazz Dots Clearinghouse, uh, the, the, some of the professional organizations, so the New York State GIS and Gizmo, which is the New York City GIS organizations, uh, that they, they frequently have listings. Uh, GeoNYC, which is kind of the tech industry uh, in New York City meetup group, uh, they, will have, they will have some listings for those kinds of dedicated positions. So those positions are also the kinds of positions that often require a master's degree. Uh, for the other stuff, for the stuff that's not a full-time GIS position, that's much more distributed. It's not in a single industry, so it can be a lot harder to find. And it's the sort of thing where someone's looking for a project manager or is looking for someone who, is, who can do some management or can do field surveys uh, and also needs some GIS experience. Uh, so I have a former, former student who's at a logistics firm in Manhattan right now. And she, you know, she was having, you know, it, it was, she has, you know, she's comfortable doing logistical work. She frequently works with tables, uh, but that was a much more generic job site kind of search. Uh, and the GIS was the special little plus that got her over the hump into the position, you know, what, they, what made sure that she, you know, when, 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 what took the pool from a hundred candidates to five candidates and those five candidates were the ones with GIS. Uh, that, that sort of thing. So the, the, that would be the much more common kind of uh, workforce, LinkedIn uh, kinds of positions. Uh, I said, that, that's a good question, Tom. I have another link I can send you. Send me an email to remind me. I'll be happy to send it out to you. Uh, all right, uh, moving on to the next question here. Uh, da, 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 da. All right. For okay, so for freshmen first coming in as uh, as undergraduates for this, uh, uh, then what experience or skills would you need to take the first intro class? Well, not if if you're in Hofstra, you are qualified to take this class. Uh, I, I it, it is not something that requires a lot of tech savvy. I and I've been teaching for years, and I've had students across the whole range of experience with technical experience with this sort of thing. I've had students who already knew how to code in Python, but I've also had students who barely knew how to navigate around Microsoft Windows or were not entirely comfortable turning on the computer. You know, and I will meet people where they're at. Uh, the people who think. You know, uh, the specific student I think of who was especially uh, uh, you know, concerned about, you know, the accidentally deleting data was really not comfortable at the beginning of the semester. Uh, she finished the semester a pro. She pulled an A in the class. Uh, so, you know, she earned it. Uh, the, but, uh, you know, the, it, it was absolutely a good learning experience, as it absolutely should be. But I wouldn't look at it as, oh, you need to know how to draw regression lines or do standard deviation or, you know, the no latitude and longitude uh, to, to get started in an intro class. It's the introductory class for regions, which, you know, if, if you've gotten into Hofstra, you are qualified to take this class. Uh, then, then there's no, no, no walking in expectations that you've got any more background than that. Uh, and again, if you do have other questions, uh, feel free to track me down, shoot me an email. I'd be happy to field any questions you've got about that. Uh, okay, um, moving on to the next one. What kind of personal computer laptop would you recommend uh, for if someone who expects to be using GIS in the future? Uh, if you're using it in a career uh, and you're out of school, your employer should cover that. Uh, if you are running a, if you're working freelance or something like that, I, I would recommend a computer, that, you know, a laptop that has some chops, but unless you're working with truly huge data, most basic laptops these days are gonna be able to run the software. The software is not limited by the software. The software is limited by how big is the data set you're plugging into it. Uh, so they, they, that if you're running, you know, big data social media analyses, well, you should really be running that on a server someplace else anyway. That's not going to be the computer sitting in front of you. Uh, uh, if you're really throwing around multi-gigabyte data sets, that might run very slowly. You might want to rent some time on a server or something like that. But for example, for uh, the GIS classes we run here at Hofstra, the, the, if you're a student, most laptops will do just fine. Uh, is that uh, I have some students who run GIS on their laptops and they're nothing especially special. Like, you know, these are not gaming setups or something like that. It's a, you know, 
pretty standard corporate, you know, I've got it right here, a pretty standard corporate uh, Lenovo ThinkPad, and it runs most of my analyses just fine. And the ones that are really hardcore, I wouldn't give them to students because it's not fair. They shouldn't be, you shouldn't be evaluated based on how fast your computer is. You should be based on the on how well you're achieving the uh, objectives of the class. Uh, so I would win around down the data so that you could be sure to process it. We also have a few uh, facilities here at Hoster, like the Pride Desktop, which we're getting, I'm getting better at making sure that it's actually GIS friendly. It's, it's been a little bit of a struggle Still not my favorite, but it's a lifesaver in the pandemic right now. Um, so that I I'd, I'd actually wouldn't sweat it too much as a student what computer you've got because uh, the, the, the Pride Desktop opens up a lot of things. And when the pandemic is over, you can come into our dedicated computer lab that we have in Global Studies and Geography, uh, and you can use the sweet, sweet 24 inch dual monitor displays we have with real graphics cards and make everything smooth and fast. Uh, the, 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 I'm a big believer, okay, I like graphics, but I'm a big believer in having as much screen real estate as I can get. Uh, it absolutely helps with this sort of stuff. So if you wanna go out and buy a big screen, you can, but uh, certainly for study in GIS here at Hofstra, it's not necessary for you to buy it yourself. There are plenty of facilities here. And if it is something you're curious about, Faith, I'd be happy to chat with you about it a bit more. Uh, all right. Uh, I, all right. Is geographic information easily manipulated to support certain agendas, or is it act, or is it more up to the actual way the map is designed that can be misleading? Uh, misleading. So more or less, can you mislead people with maps and data? To which I say. Yes. In fact, I've done a lot of work on this sort of thing. As is that I have an entire lecture in Intro GIS about cartographic rhetoric and how to smell the bullshit when someone's trying to feed it to you. Uh, to being able to be, being able to figure that out is an important, a very important skill these days, especially in the age of a lot of actually kind of re remarkably professional-looking graphics and maps that are coming from thoroughly disreputable places online. Uh, so that uh, this is the sort of thing where I'd say it is geographic data, just by what data you choose to use, just like in photography, what do you take a picture of? What time of day, who's in it, who's not? You can make a place look like a terrible place to live. You can make a place look like a great place to live. There are all sorts of ways to massage the data, always all sorts of ways to massage the map to make it fit whatever story you're telling. So what I really emphasize in class is developing a professional code of what is ethical under these circumstances and to be thinking very carefully about what are the what are the consequences of my actions not only if this map is misread uh, but especially if this map works as intended uh, okay uh, all right uh, moving on to the next question here uh, da, da, da. Uh, uh, someone saying the virtual desktop worked very well for them. Okay, great, Faith. And actually, yeah, actually, Faith, I didn't notice it was you when you asked the question. If you do have any specific questions about uh, Geography 159, I'd be happy to field any questions about that. That one he also has Adobe, but you'll be able to run that from home as well this semester. Uh, I'll have that information for you probably in the next few days. Uh, okay. All right. I, any final questions? All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I'll hold on at the very end in case anyone does have any individual questions. You can always look me up on the website. Uh, I'm always happy to chat. And, uh, as I said before, I'm always looking for new and interesting projects in the area. Thanks a lot, everybody.